Cassidy. I am the hippie Catholic. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, please subscribe to be part of the conversation with my best friend Kate, who's joining us. I'm her sidekick. We are here with the lovely Gemma Hoskins, who was featured on Netflix The Keepers. This is not affiliated with Netflix, but um, we're going to talk about um, Gemma's new book, Keeping On. And we're just delighted to have you, Gemma. Thank, Thank you. you. It's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. I'm going to play um, The Keepers trailer so that if you guys like want to see the show or want to kind of get an idea of like what the documentary series is about, here it is. Baltimore has always been a quintessentially Catholic city. The priests were the authority. Whatever they told you to do, you did. The city has its level of corruption. Sister Kathy exemplified this spirit of compassion and kindness. I have never had a teacher like that before. She was murdered our senior year, and it's always haunted many people in the community. Our mission, we were driven to find out who hurt Sister Kathy. People pop up from 45, 50 years ago who say, I have a story I'd like to tell you. I believe Kathy Sesnick was killed because she was going to talk about what went on at Keo. There's an on-the-record public story of what happened to Sister Kathy. And then there's the world beneath. The police department and the state could provide protection for the priest. There were other people brought in, local business owners, politicians that were part of this network. I can testify that over a hundred victims have been abused. Time is getting short for us to be able to figure out what happened to Kathy. My father said to my mother, you want to know why I drink? Because we killed a woman and we put her behind the shop. He said, you see what happens when you say bad things about people? This goes bigger and deeper than we can imagine. The story is not the nun's killing. The story is the cover-up of the nun's story. This video will contain spoilers for the Keepers, so if you don't like spoilers, or go, go watch the Keepers and come back. Um, spoiler warning, yeah, we're going to proceed on. <laughs> Could you tell us a bit about Sister Kathy and her case? It, well, Sister Kathy says Nick was a nun who was an English teacher and drama teacher at Archbishop Keogh High School when I attended there. So she was my teacher. And she's really the reason I became a teacher because she was such an amazing person, woman. Um, beside the fact that she was a nun, which really didn't mean a whole lot to me, she was just a really cool person. I watched her teach because her teaching was so uh, magical that it made us want to work hard for her. And she set the standards really high, but it was always kind. We had fun. It was challenging. And we were like, more and more. And she kept raising the standards and we kept reaching it. So I was so fortunate to have her as a role model and I tried to use all of her um, strategies in my classroom and they worked and it, you know, losing her was horrible for us. So in my senior year, Kathy had already left Archbishop Keogh High School. She and another sister, Sister Russell Phillips, who is a woman, Helen Russell Phillips, um, they moved into an apartment in the community not far from Keogh because they were doing an experimental social um, adventure to work in public schools because they felt that they could reach more young people if they were working out in the public schools. Archbishop Keogh was a private girls' school. Uh, we all paid tuition and, uh, you know, we wore uniforms. It was very monotonous. And I think Kathy and Russ kind of wanted a different challenge. But I also think that because of what was happening at the school, which 
is the reason that she was murdered, I think that they felt like it was better for them to leave because the chaplain, um, Joseph Maskell, I can't even call him reverend or father because he was neither of those two. He was abusing some of the girls along with other men and some of the sisters were actually involved in the physical abuse. Um, and some of those young women went and told Kathy. I believe she left because she really couldn't do anything about it by staying there. So after she left Keo, she moved into the apartment with Sister Russell. And in November of the following school year, she disappeared and two months later was found murdered. So it's never been, quote, solved. I believe the police know who did it, but I'm not sure they want it solved because there were police officers and politicians who were involved in the abuse and it's gonna take down a lot of people. I was not abused, I was very fortunate. Uh, a lot of people wonder if I was abused and that's why I'm doing this. No, I grew up in a family, um, we lived in a row house, which is now called a townhouse was wasn't big um six of us plus my grandmother in one bathroom but you know what nobody was hitting anybody nobody was getting drunk nobody was getting slapped around or abused or doing drugs so for the for the 50s and 60s we were pretty functional that's really awesome to hear especially like there was so much dysfunction during that time period oh, yeah. my dad went to catholic school his whole life and he used to talk about like as a kid he would never want to be an altar boy and my dad is a very devout catholic and it's like right. i'm a catholic too um but he would never want to be an altar boy and he would always like say oh there's like molesters in there and he said it was always just like a gut instinct which was like or he just always felt weird about it and like sure enough he's like in his 50s now sure enough some of the priests that were like active priests when he would have been an altar boy were right. abusing children and your gut never lies right and i don't ever want to imply that all priests and nuns are abusers they're not the majority of them are wonderful, really good people. The uh, pedophilia is rampant in the Catholic Church. And if I can do anything to stop it and make the world better for kids and, and adults too, because it follows you your whole life, um, that's what I'm all about. And that's what, the, that's what the book title means. That's really why I'm here. I think that's why I was born. Gemma, you are a gem. You are a gem. Thank you. My mom told me that. <laughs> you uh, tell us how Sister Kathy influenced your life. Well, I alluded a little bit to that. My dog's jumping up on my leg. If you guys think I'm looking down, I'm not dropping things. He just wants to be part of it. Um, yeah, she did. As I said, she didn't influence me spiritually because I am not a religious person. I do not practice my Catholic, my, I do not practice the Catholic faith anymore. I haven't for quite a while. And I believe the institutional Catholic church needs to, um, ex to needs to show its cards because that's, that's where, you know, I believe that the cover up of the abuse and her murder went all the way to the Vatican. Somebody said, let's put a lid on it. So the way she influenced me was she made me want to be a better person. I don't know that I was, but she made me want to be. And I think because her, like I said, her standards were so high. When I tried out for the uh, drama club, I had to get up on stage and read a piece from some Shakespeare or some Greek thing that meant, meant nothing to me. And it was obvious it meant nothing to me because she sat in the audience and she said, like, make me believe you, Gemma. And I was like, oh my God, I've disappointed Sister Kathy and I want to be in this show so badly. So um, I did it again and she said, go out and come back in and really make me believe you. And that's the kind of person she was. She was very kind, but if I'm driven, it's probably because of her. She was always determined. She was always gracious and kind. I 
can imagine girls going to her and telling her that they were having problems with another adult in the building because that's the kind of person she was. So she influenced me that way. She influenced my teaching in many, many ways. I can't even like tell you how many things that I tried in my classrooms. Um, I was fortunate enough, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I really owe it to her that in 1992, which is probably before you two were born, right? It was, I was the Maryland teacher of the year. And I really owe that to Kathy because I used her strategies and it worked and they don't take your name out of a hat. They look at how you teach and how you, uh, what your philosophy of teaching is. And I always felt like if there is fun involved in teaching, then you can teach anybody anything. And I always set up the parameters in terms of what I expected from my students and it pretty much boiled down to respect. And we just worked within that. And I had, I have um, been reconnected with so hundreds of my students because I taught for like 40 years, right? And I taught um, grade school and middle school and then I taught teachers. So I was a teacher mentor for several years before I retired. And so all of those people that we've influenced each other, it's all like we've all reconnected because of the keepers and because of the book, I think. And so I have this whole wonderful group of friends that's real diverse. My life is really like a tapestry right now because I have people who are um, abuse survivors, I have people who are in law enforcement, I have friends like you who are in the media, I have um, friends who, you know, reconnected with me from all the way back to first grade. So I feel really lucky about that. But Kathy is responsible for a lot of who I am, I think. She reminds me a lot of, um, I had a teacher that really changed my life in high school. Um, I had a French teacher um, we call her Madame, and she she really had just like a fantastic impact on my life, and just kind of like I think I connected with Kathy too because when I see Kathy, I think of Madame, and uh -huh. just like she has that kind of impact on people. So like, <laughs> there's so much that a good teacher can do, like for the world. I'm telling you. So I guess you kind of alluded to this in the, the previous answer to the previous question, but like, what's your spirituality and how did Sister Kathy influence it? There is a big difference between religion and faith. They're not the same thing, okay? Religion to me is organized, institutional, okay? And I am not part of a religion. I was raised Catholic which is in the book and to me to be honest with you it was pretty much based on boredom fear and guilt and that's not the way that children should be raised even the whole wearing a uniform thing i mean we liked it because we didn't have to worry about what we were going to put on the next day and nobody was competing with each other but there's something about that that's like the stepford wives to me that it's a little cultish, I don't know. Um, and the nuns, we were afraid of them. We were afraid of the priests. And if they told you to do something, you did it because they were gonna tell your parents if you misbehaved. So um, my experience in high school was, was great. I knew nothing about what was going on with the abuse in the building. I my neither my sister or I she was three years behind me we had no idea and when I think that we would walk down that hall and the only thing that separated us from the hell that was going on in that priest's office was a one-inch door I'm I'm just appalled that he got away with it and he was so manipulative that he was able to do that so um, um, back to um, how Kathy has impacted my spirituality. Her whole story, the murder, the cover-up, has really destroyed my faith in the Catholic Church, in the institutional Catholic Church. And when I think, you know, what would Kathy do? She would do the right thing. And so the right thing is to speak out and not to hide. And that's what 
people like me who are advocates and people who are abuse survivors did in the keepers, those women didn't have to show their faces and they did. Now I want to know where, where is the Pope being interviewed about the keepers? I want to see the Bishop being interviewed on television about the keepers. All they did was put out, you know, pamphlets, um, sent letters home to the girls who were presently at, at the school saying, don't talk to anybody, don't talk to the media, don't do this, don't do that, it's all not true. Um, you know, poor Charles Franz, the dentist, he was just persecuted by the comments that were made about him not telling the truth. So for, for me, the spirituality I would feel from Kathy would be more of what's the right thing to do. So because I don't practice a, a religion, I do live at the beach. And I've thought so many times I go up there every single day and I sit there and I look at the sand and I look at the water and I look at the sky. And I saw this really beautiful picture of all three that my niece sent me and it said, um, happy Easter from my church. And to me, that kind of is where it all is because who can explain the sky? Like, Science can't explain infinity. The sky is forever. Can you like think about that? It never ends. We're not inside a bubble. We're not inside a snow globe. And I sit there and I look at it, and it almost I'm almost scared because I'm thinking, I'm looking at infinity. Now that blows my mind. That makes me believe that there's something else, there's a higher power. And that's where I get my strength. That's where I get my, my calm. Um, you know, I, I was, um, if people who read the book know that I was married at one time and my husband died of cancer when he was 35. And he said to me the day before he died, he said the time we have here, and he was not religious either. He was like a kind of old hippie dude, cute as can be. But anyway, he said, the time we have here on earth is like a grain of sand compared to what we have afterwards. And I look at the beach and I'm like thinking, holy smoke, that is a very long time. So I guess I'm more tuned into nature now. Um, I still, I'm so angry and determined to do what I can to expose what's happening in the Catholic Church and it's still being covered up. I do ask Kathy and my husband and my mom who's deceased for strength and guidance and I always say like what would Kathy do and I think about what she would do and then I try and do it so I guess that's a big I guess that's a big spiritual influence. That's really that's really wonderful and I think that I definitely believe in the communion of the saints. That's obviously a Catholic thing. So it's like, I believe that loved ones are in heaven. I, I think that we can pray to them and that they can help intercede for us in our lives and to help us when we need them. I, I believe that, that Kathy is up there helping you and, and helping all of her students, I think. Well, I think so, because so many people who were never would never have talked about this are talking about it now. And Maryland is doing a criminal investigation into clergy abuse, much the same way that Pennsylvania did two years ago when Josh Shapiro, you know, that dropped that bomb of all the priests who were abusing children. And the investigation is into its third year and it's still continuing. And I think I've probably sent, not that I'm like the good guy, but people don't know what to do. And I have sent at least 30 to 35 people to that investigator. So everything that happened to them, or if they saw something in the archdiocese, somebody hiding something or getting rid of records, it's all been reported. It's all coming out and heads are going to roll. And I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not sorry. I can't wait it's, it's, that will be justice. So absolutely. Well, and it's like, we have such a sexual abuse problem just in our society. It's been so, mm -hmm. up. Yeah. I mean, you talk to anybody from like, who like was like a teenager in like the 1980s or 1990s, right. like, 
there's so many women I've talked to from like the 1980s that they're like, huh, I guess that was sexual assault. No. Oh, like something that happened at a party or, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, I guess I wasn't just being irresponsible. Oh, I guess. And they're like usually like in their 40s or 50s, like in just coming to terms yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, because we just live in a culture of cover up. And I think that in the church, it expands all over the world, but I think that we yeah. definitely see it in America because not only do we have it in the church, mm -hmm. but we just have it in in the government, obviously Kavanaugh's mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court, we we see ab abusers get slaps on the wrist and just get to go out free to everybody else, like even if they serve their time. Right. A lot of gaslighting. There's so much fear and shame attached to talking about what has happened, like for women usually to talk about what happened to them and for men too, especially men. Because if a, if a man is abused by, let's say, a priest, they think that indicates they're gay. What well, has nothing to do with your sexuality, it's pedophilia. And those two things are not the same. So um, it's a really, we're in a, in a very difficult situation. And like you referred to Kavanaugh before, um, that we have to keep fighting for that because uh, women should not have to, um, you know, be told that didn't happen. He was credibly accused. I'm just really, really happy that you're helping all of those survivors. And just, yeah, thank you for all of that work. That's Thanks. Amazing. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I wish there was more I could do, but we do have resources and we can help people in Maryland and Pennsylvania pay for their therapy. We have a fund set up, the Sister Kathy Sesnick Fund. I can send you some links to some of that stuff. You know, we can find, uh, help people find uh, therapists or give them the names of, you know, what detective to talk to in their county or city who does sex crimes. And so we've collected a lot of information that's like all in one place for people, which is nice for some people who don't really know what to do and don't want to have to start making phone calls. I'll put all of those links in the description box below for you. Thanks. Guys. Yeah, I'll send them all to you. How did you start this uh, grassroots justice movement? And again, people can read my book. Hold the book up there, Cassidy. <laughs> <laughs> I was approached in 2005 by a gentleman named Tom Nugent, who was a writer. He was a true investigative journalist. There aren't too many of them around anymore who are willing to put their boots on the ground and go find the real story. And he was going through yearbooks at Archbishop Keogh, trying to find people that knew Kathy. And he was writing a story called Who Killed Sister Kathy? So he just started looking in phone books and he, he called me, introduced himself and he, you know, said, I'm trying to find people that knew her and anybody you think would like to talk about her or anybody would like to talk about who may have killed her. So we created a nice relationship. He lived in the Midwest. And um, so I helped him with that story. And that story is the one that is, he's sitting in the attic at the beginning of the keepers with that story on his lap. And that was, um, not as much of a bombshell as we thought because the regular newspapers were afraid to publish it. The Sun Papers thought there were too many legal loopholes, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and he had worked for all those newspapers. So in Baltimore, there's a paper called the City Paper. You would love it, Cassidy, since you're like the hippie Catholic because it was like um, a very liberal, uh, not inappropriate, like Baltimore's Rolling Stone, okay, and they jumped on it, they published it, and it, you know, made some ripples, but the story wasn't finished yet, so, so and, and in the book, I, I print the uh, emails I had with Tom over the next few years, trying to figure out, you know, are we going to work on this, and finally, he said, I'm coming back to Baltimore, let's meet, and with that, we started um, talking to women who wanted to talk to him about abuse at the school. 
we had no idea how much had happened. So um, I started working with him. We opened up a um, Facebook page, and then Abby, who had, Abby Schaub, who had gone to Kio with me, but we, we weren't in the same group, and we haven't been friends for all these years, but she was interested, so she came into it. So we started a Facebook page called uh, Justice for Catherine Sesnick and Joyce Malecki, and things just grew from there. So a lot of people think that we did the investigation for the documentary. That's not at all what happened. The documentary found, the filmmakers found us, and we were already several years into the investigation. And they, um, the uh, director's aunt went to Keo and sent him the article that Tom had written and said, what do you think? Because he's a documentary filmmaker. So he came to Baltimore and he met with Jean, who's Jane Doe, and came back several times. And her family really grilled him because they, they wanted to be absolutely sure that this was gonna be done respectfully and on her terms. So once she made the commitment, um, and Abby and I were, as I said, several years into the investigation already, doing what we could, they got in touch with me. And I talked for a couple hours on the phone and they felt right and I trusted them and we just went from there. So over the next three years, they were in Baltimore about a week or 10 days out of every month, flying back and forth from LA to Baltimore. Um, they financed most of it themselves, you know, until people started paying attention to what they were doing and they started getting some supporters. Um, and then that's, that's how it all happened. And then once the Keepers was um, released, we had no idea it was going to be so huge, except that I kind of thought it was because it was, it was uh, released in 125 countries in 25 languages. So there's people watching the Keepers like with my mouth and like another language coming out. <laughs> my mouth. So I guess I speak 25 languages now. I don't know. That was in 2014. And I'm still, I still work on this every single day. I mean, I'm talking to you and I have, um, doing podcasts with people that nobody's ever talked to. Uh, we have a podcast coming up with a woman who was the medical assistant for Christian Richter, who was the gynecologist that uh, Maskell took girls to for illegal procedures and she was the medical assistant. She has a lot to share. Uh, we have one coming up who was very good friends with Russell, sister Russell Phillips and she has a lot to share. So um, there's always something new and yeah, people can look. I've done about 60 podcasts with my podcast buddy like you guys are, um, Shane Waters. And they're all on his podcast called Foul Play. And it's season two. And they're all about Sister Kathy and Joyce. I've been listening to Foul Play. Like, also, like, I found this, like, art of, like, you and, like, your buddy, like, doing Foul Play. And I'm going to, like, show it here. Because, like, Foul Play is such a good podcast. Like, I've been listening to you guys, like, just for, like, updates on the case, too. But like right. a really good podcast, like ten out of ten would recommend that podcast. Anyway, yeah, want to listen? We get, to we get, we found some. We were able to do a podcast with the hunter that found Sister Kathy. I don't know if you've heard that one, but he told us he's like an older man now. He told us that the day that Kathy was found is the only day anybody ever questioned him. Like nobody's ever gone back now that the case has been, you know re-energized and we gave his information. He wants to be interviewed again. I sent all his contact information to the police and they never called him. That's really ridiculous. I, I shrugged my shoulders a lot, like go figure. I would like to say I'm shocked, but I'm also, I'm just not surprised that that's the, cause mm -hmm. everybody always thinks that everything works out like the movies that, you know, it, it doesn't. 
Oh, I haven't talked to Abby for years because we've gone our separate ways, but we I know we both send everything we have to the police or to the FBI, and the information only goes in one direction. They don't share anything. So um, I just don't think they want this to be solved, to be honest with you. We're talking 51 years, yeah. and how can they not know who did this? Uh, and there's so many things that weren't done, like talking to the hunter, duh. That doesn't make any sense to me. He should have had detectives visiting him and showing him where, the house that he went to to make the phone call, and it hasn't happened. Like, I'm really glad that we have The Keepers on Netflix because that is, like, I mean, that's how I found out about Sister mm -hmm. Cassidy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, you know, Cassidy, they haven't put it out on a DVD yet because it's still trending on Netflix. They don't have to. And people that do have it, maybe they have one that's pirated, that's on eBay, or if people are selling one, it's a media copy, which means that those were sent out to reviewers before the series was released, and reviewers don't get all seven episodes they'll be missing a couple episodes, but they'll be sent enough so that they can write a review about it or interview some of us before it gets released. So folks, don't buy the keepers on eBay. Don't buy it yet. You're not gonna get the right, you're not gonna get the whole thing. And I just saw something on TV Guide that it's one of the top 10 uh, documentaries on Netflix still. I think it has a cinematic quality that's very different than most documentaries. It, to me, it feels more like a piece of artwork that's being created as you're watching it. I have a major composer crush on the man that did the music, his name's Blake Neely, and I wrote him a note when it was finished, like saying, hi, I'm Gemma, and thanks for you know what you did. And later in the mail, like, couple weeks later he sent me cds of all of the um the documentaries that he's done with our director ryan white so i could have the music from each one of them which i thought was really kind but i asked him and he said the music from the keepers is not going to be out on a cd because it's just not and I said, oh, darn, I want, like, isn't there a piece of music called Gemma? Or isn't there a piece yeah. of music called The Investigators, you know? And the filmmakers were Tripod Media. And people can, can go look on the Tripod Media Facebook page or website and see all the other movies that they've made. Because they've made some really incredible films before and after The Keepers. So you talked a little bit about your childhood. Like, how was mm -hmm. your childhood? I had a great childhood most of the time. I, and again, I'll t I talk about this in the book. I always, I have an incredible memory. I have memories back to when I was two, literally. And I can remember everything in color. And I know that my memories are accurate because I would remember something and I'd ask my mother, when did that happen? And she said, you were only two. Are you kidding? You remember that? But I do. So I wrote everything down. And um, I was the uh, second of four. I had an older sister, younger sister and a younger brother. We lived in a row house. We had a playground behind us and we spent all our days and evenings on the playground until all the moms would flip the back porch lights on and we'd have to go in and they'd be calling our name for dinner. But anyway, um, but when I was 10, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So, of course, what 10 year old wants to have to start being married to a needle, right? And that was tough for me. And I talk about it in the book. And I had... Um, a number of health issues growing up that were not easy to deal with and that was one of them so i think it made me really stubborn i think it made me kind of a control freak because if you don't control your diabetes you're going to die 
And so I knew that that was important. I have to really watch my control because people say, oh, you should run for this or you should run for that. I'm like, no, because I'd be way too much of a control freak. I don't want to run for anything. So um, growing up was in my home was wonderful. I had two very loving parents. They were involved in everything we did at school. And even to the point where I was like, real smart and real good. And the nun gave me um, a D once and it was called deportment, but it meant behavior. And my father was like, like, what the, what the hell? So he went up to school and he's like knocked on the convent door. Like, what is this? And you know what the nun said? She wiggled the line. We had to walk in a line. Well, she wiggled the line. Well, I was delighted that I got the D because I wanted to be like with the cool kids, right? That were like misbehaving. <laughs> My father was like, don't wiggle the line. But he told, he gave her a piece of his mind. It was ridiculous, you know? So home was great. Um, school was rigid. And again, I don't know if you grew up in Catholic schools, did you? I went to public school and some okay. of my commenters are like, it's so clear that you went to public school. And I'm like, yeah, oh, no. <laughs> isn't that funny? I know. We always thought they were like publics and Catholics and the publics always seemed a little bit older and a little bit more like, I don't know, like more sure of themselves than we did. But basically working with health issues is not easy as a teenager um because you know i wanted to get high and drink beer with everybody else and i did and i survived now i'm like meticulous but the technology is so good that you know nobody heard of an insulin pump or something that could measure your blood sugar 24 7. so i have all the equipment i can and i do really well with it but you know there have been some like i have vision issues and um where my hearing aids and I have some autoimmune diseases that I go through them in the book. I've been criticized uh, by people who have reviewed the book for talking about my health. And I guess I'm thinking they didn't understand why I did it. I'm not asking for pity or sympathy. What I'm doing is saying that I've had type 1 diabetes for 60 years, 60 friggin' years. If I can do it, you can do it and I'm in good shape, and I'm not one foot in the grave. The other thing is that I think it's important for people to understand that having those issues as a kid and as a teenager makes you who you are. So if I'm resourceful, if I'm strong, if I'm outspoken, it's because of what I've had to deal with. But I've also had some amazing, wonderful, things happen to me. You know, I think I married the most wonderful man in the world and we were best friends and we had just a very short time together, but that's like the highlight of my life. It's hard for me to take criticism, but if you put, not to take constructive criticism, but if I put myself out there and I have, you're not going to get everybody to love you. You know, like, I'm like, oh, they won't? Oh, well, I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> I'm kidding. But some of the reviews have been really stinky. And I think some are from trolls. And, you know, I heard that some people returned my book. They buy it, they read it, and they return it to Amazon and get a full refund. Isn't that weird? I loved your book. Some of my favorite parts were when you were talking about your chronic illnesses. Because I think that, like, I have loved ones who have autoimmune disorders and stuff. And they get a lot of the same criticism we'll call it criticism even though i think it's just haters being haters but it's like because people just have such a hard time with invisible disabilities and they mm -hmm. think that just because you're talking about your disability that somehow you're asking for pity when you're not no i don't want that no but i have had people who have the same issues because i also have celiac disease which is like i can't eat anything with wheat barley malt or rye and that is not really even a problem anymore because everything's gluten-free but um i think um i have been criticized in some of the reviews for talking too much about like me 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 but that's not why i'm doing it it's because like if i can help somebody else that's got 
that disease, well, more power to them. Your book is really good. I mean, this is like- me. Thanks, thank you. I think that people hating on it, I think it's just because they haven't confronted their own ableism, so they're just projecting it onto other people. It could be. I have three more books coming. Yes. The second one's almost finished. That's fabulous. Yeah, the last two are about the case, but the second one, I call it the commercial break. It's called Teddy Tales, A Puppy Primer. And all the artwork is from people that know him from the keepers. They've all contributed artwork to the book. And it's a collection of poetry and anecdotes about having my first dog at the age of 60, because I never had a dog. He's whimpering now. Yeah, he wants to be part of the show. Okay, so I'm gonna actually read an excerpt from your book, if that's okay. Okay, sure. So this part of the book absolutely chilled me. He must have spent most of each day grooming and sexually abusing his innocent prey. Boys and girls, children, teens, adults. The youngest survivor I have met was three when Maskell abused her. A monster and his network lived among us. I would not know about any of this until I was in my 40s. How can you comment on that? Like, cause that was just such like, I remember I just like the hair on my like arms stood up when I read that in the book. All of what I know now, I've learned in the last six or seven years. I didn't even know that a monster lived among us, okay? But when I think about the stories I've heard, I have heard the most incredibly disgusting, raunchy um, tales of sexual abuse of children that you can imagine. And it's very true that the youngest I've talked to was, she was three when it happened, three years old. And he, she was in a daycare center at one of his parishes. And it didn't only involve her, it involved other children and making movies of children and um, trying to sell children on the street as prostitutes. And so the things that I've had to get used to, like, I, I want to cry when I talk to the people that this has happened to. It makes me so sad for them because they have this with, like, you know what I'm talking about, Cassidy. They have this with them their whole lives. And it doesn't matter what somebody does for you or with you to try and help. It's always going to be part of you. And, you know, reaching out for help is the is the huge step that each person who's dealt with it has to take but some people are living in silence and they cannot or will not or are afraid or feel guilty or shamed that this happened to them but he was everywhere he had a huge network that involved politicians business people nuns priests, uh, police officers, soldiers, um, they all took care of each other. Thugs, uh, one of the politicians that abused some of the girls at Keogh was responsible for keeping this real divey bar in Baltimore open because that's probably where they could find thugs and weird people who would take money to do weird stuff for them. So um, I'm not sure I believe that Maskell actually was there when Kathy was being killed. I think he choreographed it, but his alibi might be totally accurate. And I think that he, he always had money and he always had contacts. So, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, hypnosis were all part of the abuse, but he could also pay thugs to do his dirty work for him. And I, I do believe that Edgar Davidson and Billy Schmidt were involved the night Kathy was murdered. I don't know exactly what their roles were, whether they were the cleanup guys or whether they were the ones that, you know, put her where she was. But um, yeah, he had, it, this was a huge network. And when I say high ranking politicians, I mean like really high ranking. Um, so we had no idea this was going on. and those men would come to the school they would come to the building and you know how most schools have a 
like a circular driveway, right? And they would pull up in the circle outside his office. And there was like a, um, in front of where his office was, his office was next to the chapel. And he would lock the chapel doors to the hall and his office and men would come in through a fire door that was like behind a partition across the front of the building and he would let them in and girls would be drugged, hypnotized. Um, I had no idea hypnosis was so strong, but he gave a lot of them post-hypnotic suggestions not to talk about what happened or that if they talked about it, he told one of them she would have to kill herself. So it took her until she was like an adult, like just 10 years ago to even begin talking about it. But there are many, many women and men who were abused by him and his group. Um, and it all needs to be, it all needs to be exposed. And I'm really hoping that the criminal investigator in Maryland, I know he's a good guy. I trust him. I've talked to him. But I really hope that our attorney general will, con will convene a grand jury. And that would mean that there could be charges made to people who are still living who were involved in any of this. And I believe there's some that are still living. And the only way to solve a cold case is an eyewitness, DNA, or a confession. Those are the three ways that it can be solved, right? Mm -hmm. All three are possible, but none are likely. I bet there are a lot of people living that know exactly what happened. Yeah, I don't have any doubt about that. I'm a Catholic platform, so, because I'm a Catholic, even though I don't speak for the Vatican or anything, or, like, I'm just a lay Catholic person who's making YouTube videos. But, sure. but one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you was because I get so sick of seeing these abusers and the people who sympathize with them act like that any survivor who comes out about their story is going against the church as if the survivors aren't catholics too as if and they hide behind oh the church is just getting attacked instead of mm -hmm. being like you know right far more complex than that this is mm -hmm. usually catholic on catholic crime you mm -hmm. know it's like and why are we you know, and it's, we have to say, I, I study religion and philosophy at school, and something that religious scholars do is they look at the entirety of the religion. They look at the positive aspects of a religion and mm -hmm. the negative aspects mm -hmm. of it. Like, you know, I have to, even though I'm a progressive-minded Christian, I have to also say I'm in the same group of of, of people as the, the people who stormed the Capitol and did crazy things. People need to feel the conviction, and I'm, I'm talking especially to Catholics, we need to feel the conviction that we need to hold our, our institutions accountable and be like, we need to stand up for our Catholics who are getting hurt by this. We can't let the church mold us. We have to be, we have to be the church. We have to mold the church. We have to make it what it sh what it should be. If it's w if it was what it should be, I'd probably still be Catholic. I mean, I'm Christian. You know, I believe in God and the afterlife, and um, I struggle with it because of what's happened. And I keep thinking I have less years to live than I have lived, which is kind of like, oops, like you guys have like five times more, you know, years to live. But when you get to be in the last quarter of your life, you like, you like start asking like, oh, hmm, wonder what it is going to be like, like, cause I'm such a realist, like, okay, what is it going to be? But somebody told me I'm trying to put Niagara Falls into a thimble. So I'm not going to try and do that. How has building a Facebook movement been positive and how has it been difficult? Woo, that's an interesting question. Okay. Facebook can be toxic. Yes. I've learned that. <laughs> Having, okay, I have a, my own Facebook page, Gemma Hoskins, which I do not put anything about the case on there. Occasionally I'll put some article or something. Um, or like, if you want to make a donation, do it here. But I try and keep the two separate, uh, church and state kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. I have another Facebook page called Keeping On With Gemma. And to me, that is sacred because I have 
uh, two other administrators and 10 moderators, and we have a no-fly list. We have a list of people that we know are not permitted on that page because we know they're going to start trouble. And I've learned this, and I've, I hate to say it because I like to invite people to be part of something positive, but as soon as somebody is disrespectful or um, attacks somebody else, they're gone. We don't give them a second chance. Uh, Shane does the same thing with his podcast discussion pages. I'm not expecting everybody to be Pollyanna, but I do expect people to have spirited discussions, to answer the questions, to question the answers. Oh, I like that. Question the answers or answer the questions. Hmm, I like that. Okay, we'll have to remember that phrase. That's what we want. And I don't want people to agree with everything I say. I like to put interesting questions out there. And I want people to help me help other people and to solve this. And that is happening because people have done work for me. They have contacts. They have uh, contacts with government agencies, with celebrities, with media people. So that's what that's all about. So that's all good. Now, what is toxic is like the Keeper's official group, which is that huge uh, Netflix Keeper's group. It's 125,000 people. And I have had to leave it because there is so much arguing and so much negative energy. So I think that um, we would not say things to each other that we tend to say on Facebook. If somebody says, you know, you're really stupid, they don't have a problem saying it, but, or like you're being like a total idiot, but they wouldn't say that to my face. I want people that are, that have integrity to be on there. Intelligent people with integrity that have something to offer and some new ideas and are willing to do some digging for me because I ask all the time. It's like I said this earlier, but it's like, I, again, I'm so tired of people, these abusers mm -hmm. hiding behind the church's skirts in a way. And then it's like, mm -hmm. okay, listen, yes, while, while you are a part of the church abusers, the survivors are a part of the church too. Mm -hmm. And, and you, look how brave they're being. Yeah. yeah. Christianity has a historical history of being persecuted. That's still true in a lot of parts of the world. Christianity yeah. is persecuted in a lot of countries. But it's like people will hide behind that persecution narrative to not have to take responsibility for their mm -hmm. own actions, which is really ironic because that's literally the opposite of what Jesus says. Exactly. Today, right? How cowardly, right? There's nothing cowardly about the survivors. How has it been working with so many survivors, I guess, going off of that? Um, you know what? Sometimes it's hard. Um, I kind of see myself as like a big sister. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not I'm a friend and I'm a retired teacher and I'm an advocate. So I'm not going to go away. I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to shut up. When I hear the stories and I feel their pain, it does take its toll on me. I'm not going to say it doesn't. I'm usually a pretty even person, but sometimes it does create some anxiety, which is when I know I have to, like I have to make sure I leave quality time in every day to do things that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. So I paint, I write, I have my dog, I do 8 million house projects. If I turned this laptop around, you would see I'm halfway through painting a chair, I'm putting another chair together, cleaning out closets, so I'm never bored and I'm never lonely, but I have to make sure that a good part of my day is totally separate from murder, sexual abuse, and you know, people who are being deceitful. I have a great therapist when I need her. Um, you know, even if I just said, hey, or this is like road service, or like I'm coming for a tune up, you know, like that. But um no, it's, um, it's been a very satisfying, wonderful experience because every one of those 
individuals is really special to me. And I don't know how they have survived. I really don't. Some of them, I don't know how they physically survived some of the actual torture that, that was, you know, done to them. We're talking like satanic ritual torture and painful torture. And yeah, this is bigger and deeper than, than people have any idea. And it's like the keepers in itself was like, so like, right. and that's not even like everything. Oh, yeah. Right. It was, yeah, it's, it's hard to watch, but it's riveting. And, you know, the topic of sexual abuse of children is already pretty salacious. So they did not want to do anything to make it worse. It was way worse. And most of this I've learned just since The Keepers was released. And that's been almost four years, believe it or not, it was May of 2017. And so these, this is stuff I've learned from people who have come forward and you know, wanting to know what can they, where can they go? What can they, and you know, there's, um, the church offers mediation. If people, it's like a civil suit, but they go to mediation and they get a financial settlement and it's never enough. It's, you know, the attorney gets a third, but it's something. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of people that, um, it's been traumatic all over again because, you have to tell your story. It's re-traumatizing to attorneys that work for the archdiocese and they listen and act like they care. But I went to one of the um, sessions with a woman who didn't have anybody to go with her. And when they saw me come in, they didn't want me to come in. And I was like, I'm coming in. It's so good that like painting's so therapeutic. Like I want to get into painting, and like also I think that Kate's Danny DeVito shirt brings some like good, good positive energy. It's like yeah. Danny DeVito yeah. is like always makes everybody laugh. Like, right. Always Sunny in Philadelphia is like such a good show. Have yeah. you guys seen Shit's Creek? No. I haven't, but everybody says I need to watch. it. You would love it. Have you seen it, Kate? No, I haven't. Oh my God, you would love it. It is hilarious and very sweet, very sweet. Okay, so have there been any updates on the case since the Keepers? Hmm, there have, let's see. Hey, what can I tell you? Okay, the necklace is not part of the case anymore, okay? The necklace means nothing. Kathy's family took it. And I don't know why, but for some reason, the police and her family said it is not, it was not bought for Kathy. And I think it's because we found out that Kathy went to the store and actually inquired about how to open a bridal registry. Because, you know, she was a nun, would she know about that? Mm -hmm. And so it, um, it wasn't bought, at, there wasn't bought at a jewelry store in the Edmondson Village. But we do know there are other necklaces like it with different birthstones. And what I was told by a police officer was that they think that Edgar was a petty thief and may have stolen it like from one of the girls he tried to pick up in his car. But the necklace is like non-essential anymore, okay? Uh -huh. Um, I know everybody loved the necklace story, right? I love that story. That yeah, like it had yeah. so much closure to it. Oh, I didn't know. It. Yeah. Okay, so people who have passed away that were in the series, um, James Scannell, who was the police captain that I offered the crab cake to, he died um, the year the series came out. Neither family has really been given any good information, neither the Maleckis or Sister Kathy's family. I do know that Kathy's clothing was hand carried out to Utah to go through a process called M, capital M, VAC, V-A-C. And Detective Gary Childs, who was in the Keepers, took it out there, hand carried it in evidence bags, because the MVAC vendor, the people that invented it, live, in, I mean, are in Utah. So he went out there to have that process done. MVAC looks like a dust buster. It puts, it, it can take DNA off of anything. So it puts a fluid on, if you can picture a dust buster, then it sucks it all in and it dehydrates it. 
So what's left on the filters in the little vacuum cleaner is DNA. Now it's my understanding that there was some DNA um, on Kathy's clothing, but that it was did not have a male match, M-A-L-E. I don't know if the cops are just saying that or if it's true. I still, now this has been almost three years that that was done. They still have, are saying that they don't have any results yet. And I don't believe that. But I was also told that if you only have a little bit of DNA, it's better to wait to process it because technology moves so quickly that you can process a smaller amount if you wait a year, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because let's say, it, let's say just it's a teaspoon. I don't know how they measure it. And right now there's no technology that will identify what's in a teaspoon. But in a year, that technology could be available. So if you use the DNA this year, you won't have it anymore. It's gone. So waiting is a good thing. I don't know. This is interesting. They're like, Gemma, why don't you get in touch with CC Moore? Why don't you get in touch with the people that, you know, did the ancestry doc? I'm like, okay, do you think I have DNA in my home? <laughs> do you think they gave the DNA to Gemma to say, okay, call people? And I have no control over that DNA. I don't know where it is. I don't know who's got it. I don't know what's being done with it it would be totally up to the families and the police to reach out to those people. I do have a friend that works in a lab in Texas called Othram and they have so they have um, such high tech uh, processes there that they've solved a lot of cold cases. And I talked to the guy that runs the place. I was introduced to him very nice. He told me he reached out to Baltimore County and didn't get a response. So I don't know what that means. So yeah, there are a lot of adults who would be probably in their 70s and 80s and 90s who know exactly what was going on in that building. You see why I'm not popular to some groups? <laughs> a lot of people that hate me. I don't care. I honestly, like, if those are the kind of people hating you, that means you have, like, a higher character than, than they do. Uh, yeah, I know. But some people have said, oh, those poor nuns. And I'm like thinking, well, they should have thought about that when they were doing this stuff. Right. You know, when they were watching or when they were participating or where they were giving the girls the passes to go to the priest's office to, you know, be raped or whatever. Um, they should have thought about that. And I believe that, that they knew and they won't talk and that's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. And I think that it's also I, something I ran into is that a lot of people have been conditioned perhaps by their own families, perhaps, perhaps by their own abuse in their lives, that they think that if they keep things private and confidential that they're protecting the dignity of everybody involved but it's mostly what they don't realize is that they're usually going to end up protecting the abusers and abusers don't change by you loving on them that's right do not change and because i realized that like a lot of these people that perhaps even like some of these nuns even though i don't know them and this is all like alleged it's just like an open case and stuff but it's like I don't know, like, maybe they were afraid. I mean, we, we, we don't know. Maybe they were malicious. We don't know. But it's like, but either way, they didn't speak out. It, it's, it's always better to be honest about things mm -hmm. and come out and talk mm -hmm. about it, things like, and have like a good line of communication and stuff. Because otherwise, when you hide, like, like, light is like the best, like, purifier. I don't believe in the death penalty. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't endorse that kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, we should still like I guess like believe in like human rights of people that are like criminals and stuff but at the same time mm -hmm. we have to hold them accountable and people going and, and protecting basically protecting them they're not really protecting them because no matter what like you can't change somebody by loving on them more mm -hmm. or protecting right. them. that just keeps them exactly where they're yeah. at sometimes I wonder what do they think a deathbed confession is gonna give them the key to the kingdom? I don't think so. 
because if they've lived a life of deceit and have been encouraged and like who doesn't know about this stuff and they're still covering it up it's still happening and the people that did it are not coming clean and to me that's that's inexcusable i mean only god can forgive that kind of you know that kind of sin that kind of crime it, and it's like we need to like ask our institutions to do better. People that keep abusers in power, whether that be in institutions or in family dynamics, are mm -hmm. enablers. Right. People that are afraid to stand up and say, hey, this mm -hmm. is wrong. And they're doing a disservice to both the victim, but also, I'm, I'm saying for like lesser things, not like sexual abuse or murder or anything, but like, let's say somebody's just being toxic. If you're like sure. enabling that toxic behavior, that person's right. never going to get better. They're never mm -hmm. gonna seek to mm -hmm. be like, to check themselves and be like, hey, maybe I need to work on something. There'll be like a newspaper article, like, this priest was, you know, found out and now he's being charged. Well, I guess it would have been a really good idea if the bishop had dealt with it when it first happened and then he wouldn't have been around kids anymore. Waiting to get caught or waiting to be discovered is way worse than the church coming clean about what's going on. So that's what I'm really, really hoping for. It's like, I'm gonna move on to, I guess, a more like, I guess a more positive question. How do you think that Sister Kathy has been driving the bus? I, I always hear you say that she's driving the bus. She's driving the bus. Okay, she has become a symbol for people all over the world for doing the right thing. And even though they don't know her, and I myself, I only knew her for three and a half years, but look at the impact that she's made on my life, right? I mean, I've gone with guys for that long and they, they didn't leave that impact on my life, right? I feel like, I always say like, welcome to the tribe, like to you two, welcome to the tribe. Aww. Because we really are. And that tribe is on this Sister Kathy bus. She is the reason that we are moving forward with the behaviors and actions we are taking to uh, do what we can to repair and make things right for children. And I mean anybody under 18. Her driving the bus to me is she's the force that is empowering us to keep moving forward so she's driving the bus i always think of like, like it's like one of those like like hippie buses that she's like driving the bus <laughs> yeah like a, like a, or like a school bus right okay. and we're like jump on the sister kathy bus and people are jumping on all over the place right thank you for welcoming us to the tribe and hippie catholic community you're, you're oh. welcome too, so thank you thank and, you so um, do you think Sister Kathy should be canonized? That's, I'm probably not the right one to answer because I don't understand the whole canonization thing. It seems to me that only Catholics get to be like, do that canonization thing. Like why don't Jewish people or Episcopalians, like they have, they have people they look up to, but this whole canonization process it is like, applying to go to law school there, okay used to be there has to be three miracles now there only has to be two did you know that yeah i, so I like, like i'm like a canonization nerd because i love the saints <laughs> it's like okay but and saint Gemma, she she's scary because she had um a stigmata and she levitated she scared me because her picture was hanging out in the hallway and I could see it from my bed and it had those eyes that followed you. And I always wanted the door cracked open a little bit because I was afraid to have complete dark. I didn't want to look at her picture, right? So this whole canonization thing to me is kind of ridiculous. Like, okay, why did they change it to two miracles? Because they weren't getting enough saints. I'll have to ask some people about that that know more about like the relics and stuff because. Oh, relics. That's another thing. Did you know that you can't sell a relic on eBay? They won't allow you to sell it. 
So I have a relic from St. Gemma. What am I going to do with a little chip of her bone? To me, it's a piece of bone from like a woman that scared me. And it's like, okay, I have a friend who belongs to like a, I don't know, another, another religion. And she has saints. But how did they get to be saints? A lot of people have said she needs to be canonized. And I'm like thinking, but why? She's already like this famous, wonderful person. Why is that going to make it? The institutional church is what we're fighting against. Why are we going to ask them to make her a saint? It doesn't make sense to me. I know you don't want that answer, but it doesn't make sense to me. I'm on like the camp of like, I believe that she like deserves to be canonized because, and here's my logic for it. And this would come after like, people have been held accountable in the church and the injustice has been done, right? I feel like that if Sister Kathy was officially canonized, I feel like that that would be such like a, like kind of like just like a symbolic message of like victory. My patron saint is Joan of Arc, which we all know Joan of Arc was murdered by the institution right. of the church. Mm -hmm. She was burned at the stake mm -hmm. and a heretic for wearing men's clothes. That was considered heresy at the time. So I guess it's like for me, the concept of a saint once being persecuted by the church, but then later being canonized is not foreign to me. I'm, a, I'm big into the relics, like, <laughs> like, like, I'll take the St. Jumbo relic. I'm into relics just because, like, I've always been around them, and I just, I also just, I like folk Catholic stuff. I've also, like, there's 50 years difference between you and I. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm being very um, reticent to say, you know, I think Catholic relics and saints and all, I don't, I'm not afraid to say that I think it's kind of like a crock, but that's just me. And like, I don't know, I guess the whole canonization thing is very bewildering to me. Like, why don't, why don't Jewish people have saints? But I can understand why that whole uh, tradition of like relics and it's almost like an artistic form to you, right? You want my St. Gemma relic? You can have it. I, I would I would love that relic. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I might have misread this. Like, have, been, have you prayed to St. Gemma? Like, have you had like a, like spiritual experiences with her? Um, my mom prayed to her because my older sister had something wrong with her eye when she was born. My mother made, you know what a novena is? Yes. Okay, she made a novena and said if my sister was okay, that she would name her next daughter Gemma. But not me. St. Gemma had like weird experiences. Like she was reading out of her prayer book and the pages began to burn. And the devil appeared to her as like a vicious dog. And she had the stigmata, which scares me to death, I think. And I believe it, but I think it's, have you ever seen photographs of people with the stigmata? Yeah, I, I really like um, St. Padre Pio is kind of one of the Padre same Pio, things. right. There's a woman that's, I mean, people that are currently living that claim to have a stigmata. And um, one of them is in Pennsylvania. And um, Donna Vandenbosch, who was in The Keepers, who uh -huh. was one of the survivors, she told me she's met the woman and that when you get near her, she smells like roses. And that's supposed to be typical of people with a stigmata. She said she has seen her hands and when she stops bleeding, there's no wound there. But if you, I've seen photographs of Padre Pio, but I also have just looked up photographs of people with a stigmata. It is gory. Uh, my mother always said St. Gemma had her arm around our family and I'm not sure like I felt that way. I sound like a terrible um, heretic right now. But no, you're, you're I, I probably, I'm probably a, the, one, the priest that married my husband and I and did my husband's funeral is just a wonderful person, but he left the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, he, um, he said, Gemma, I'm kind of a, a heretic because um, I'm not sure what I believe anymore. And I was like, Oh, don't tell me that I need guidance from you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you need to keep doing what you're doing because you're doing it right. I spoke with a really wise um, priest about this one time, about what, what going off of what you said about like, why don't other cultures have saints and stuff. For one thing, the Episcopals, or 
like the Episcopalians and the Lutherans do have saints and they have some of their own saints and they have some saints that are the same as the Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we also believe that there's a lot of saints that we don't know that are just regular people who just mm -hmm. live their lives and live simply that, yeah, maybe they're not recognized by the church, but that doesn't mean that they're not a saint. And but like, did they have to go through the like number of miracles and like, it, that just seems silly to me. This priest said that like, there's more, even if the church doesn't recognize somebody as a saint, that doesn't mean that God doesn't see them as a saint. Right. Well, I wasn't brought up in a religious family. I didn't even like know much about Catholicism at all until I met Kat. I'm like the mystic folk Catholic weird girl that everybody goes to about They're like, hey, wait, like, can you light your candle for this? And I'm just like, okay, that's okay. <laughs> we need you. We need you. <laughs> Basically, my story that it was like for, for months, I was like, why re watching the keepers, writing notes on it. And then, like, one night I was just like, you know what? I was feeling super mystical and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to like give it a go. I'm going to pray to Sister Kathy because she, she has to be up there. Like she's got to be a saint up there. To do. And I said, no, I think that's cool. And I'm like, hey, Kathy, like, I'm like, and I basically just said, I'm like, I would really like to talk to one of your students about this and talk about it on, on the channel. Within mm -hmm. three days, I connected with you. Oh, there, no, there are no coincidences. Thank <laughs> you, Kathy. I no, I get my energy. I get energy from her. Sure. Like saints can do stuff like that. Here's what she probably did. She probably said to my mother, should we send her to Gemma? And she said, my mother was like, sure. My husband was like, oh my God, they'll never stop talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Send her to Gemma. They'll never stop talking. Within three days. And it was like in three is like a holy number, obviously with like the church and stuff. And I was like, yeah, so that was my like little like saint story with um, with Kathy. Thank you so much for wanting to send that relic to me. Like, that's, I really appreciate sure. it. Sure, I'll send it to you. I think I have the book that's the story of her life. So I can send them both to you. You can have them. Who killed Sister Kathy, in your opinion? Did you read the book? Yeah. Okay, I don't do spoilers. Okay. okay, that makes sense. That makes you sense. have to. We you knew I was going to say that. The chapter that tells says, "I know you looked at this chapter without reading the rest of the book, right?" <laughs> yeah. Were you surprised? I was. I was surprised, but not surprised. So everybody, like, go purchase Gemma's book to like find out who Gemma thinks. Right. The they can also. Um, I also did the audible version in my own Baltimore accent, which took all last summer, but it was interesting to do. And that's available at Amazon and the ebook for people that don't that have trouble reading small print. I guess finally, here's like a call to action. I guess like, what would you like to see from the Vatican? And how can Catholics or any other viewers get involved with the fight to end clerical abuse? Demand the release of records uh, demand that from the top down and the bottom up that the Catholic Church is purged of pedophiles. I don't know if people are aware of this, but once those individuals are defrocked or have their, um, defrocked means they're not a priest anymore. If they have their faculties removed, it means they're still a priest, but they can't um, perform the sacraments, okay? The church does not keep track of where the credibly accused abusers are living. Mm -hmm. And we asked about that, and we were told by the spokesperson, Sean Kane, for the archdiocese, well, it's like Home Depot. They don't keep track of their employees if, they're, if they leave. And I'm like thinking, it's not like Home Depot. We're talking, about, we're talking about credibly accused individuals living out in the community. So now the responsibility is off the, off the church and the onus is on society. So my mom, for example, lived in a retirement community until she died at the wonderful age of 94. And a, one of those credibly accused priests could have been living down the hall with her from her on the church's dime. So they're still getting their pensions. The church pays for their. And so we said, how do you keep track of them? And he said, we don't. 
So once they're out, that's like giving them license to do whatever they want. I know people don't hear that part. If a priest is defrocked or has their, is laicized or has their faculties removed, that does not keep them from offending. That is an equation that doesn't match. So, okay, you're offending, you're abusing children, so we're going to kick you out. Now you're not going to abuse anymore? No, you're going to do it more and we don't have to hear about it. And we'll pay for you to live in a nice place and you're not you're an unregistered sex offender this is my call to action they cannot be unregistered sex offenders they have to be charged they're never charged it's always settled out of court very few are ever charged and spend time in jail so that's yeah that's my call to action is uh if you're going to get rid of them charge them if they're convicted they belong in jail um, you got to keep track of where they are. You can't just let them be out there. No. You know, that to me is like crazy. They let them go live in another country and hang out on playgrounds or whatever. You know, your eyes are great when you're surprised. <laughs> Cassidy, you're yeah. like, I know. Like, my, yeah. yeah, she does. I <laughs> just, and I'm just like, well, yeah, because I mean, people don't think about that, that they're well, out there. They're, they're living in nice retirement communities as unregistered sex offenders on the church's dime. On our donation dime. I'm going to leave all the resources that were included at the end of Gemma's book for any of you guys. If any of you have experienced clerical abuse. Right. They need um, help. Yep. Th th these resources are there for you. Uh, my prayers are with you guys. Here's my other thing. If anybody listening or watching this has been abused, do not report it to the church. Call 911, period. Do yeah. not give the church the opportunity to move that person or get them out of the country. Do not report it to the church. Call 911 and have them arrested. I think very that's, that's very good advice. Thank you so much for your time, Gemma. Thank you. And just, I already love you guys. You're so cute. I love you, love you too. And th you're, like, good, you're good at what you did. This was fun. Okay. You can connect to St. Gemma because she scares the heck out of me. <laughs> okay. So Teddy and mommy are going to take a walk and then we're going to eat dinner. Okay. Thank nice. You, thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for watching everybody. I'm Cassidy. I'm the hippie Catholic. And I'm her sidekick. God bless. <laughs> Bye.